conversation with the candidate continues. Welcome back to our conversation with the candidate and tonight's guest, Congressman Tim Ryan of Ohio. It's time to bring in questions from our audience. I will jump in with a follow-up if necessary, but basically this belongs to the New Hampshire voters right now. So let's get to our first question from Joan Wentworth. Right, thanks. Good evening, Congressman Good evening. Ryan. What are your thoughts on the types of circumstances where the president should or should not issue an executive order? And as president, would you support setting limits on their use? That's a great question. Um, it's easy as a member of Congress to say it should be very limited as to whether or not a president should issue uh, executive orders. I, it, everything is circumstantial. Uh, circumstantial. Um, when you look, for example, when President Obama was uh, doing executive orders around DACA, making sure we were protecting those kids, I don't know what the Congress is going to look like. I don't know what we're going to be able to pass or not pass. So it's circumstantial. I will say there'll be a couple principles. Is it, is it going to protect people? Will it help people? Will it help the environment? I mean, there's all kinds of different executive orders you can issue. And as we have this conversation over the course of the next year, I hope people will understand my values. And I would be willing to use executive orders if it's going to support the kind of things that, that we as a country should stand for, like protecting the DACA kids. But I can't give you a specific answer just because, you know, I hope we have a Democratic House and a Democratic Senate, but we may not. And so therefore you may have to revert to executive orders to protect children or the environment. Okay. Thank, Thank you, you Joan. Next question comes from Elizabeth Radisich. Good evening, Congressman. Thank evening. you for being here for our questions. Thank you. Do you think the federal government should make marijuana legal? I think cannabis should be legal, yes. I think it, at this point there is a, a real issue around the criminal justice system where white kids and white people uh, go to prison four times as much as people of color for the same crime around uh, marijuana. I think that's, that's a civil rights issue when, in, in my estimation. And so I also think there's a lot of opportunity. Uh, we have medical marijuana in Ohio. It's already drawing investment. It's already uh, producing jobs in communities, old Rust Belt communities. So I think there's a lot of opportunity here. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. Next question comes from Stephen Kidder. Thank you so much. This is real rapid fire here. <laughs> I mean. um, I'm an ACLU voter, which means I cast, uh, when I cast my ballot, I care about civil liberties. Yes. And an issue that's really important to me is immigration. Um, so across the country, and specifically here in New Hampshire, ICE is pressuring local law enforcement to detain people so that ICE agents can then take custody of them. Will you commit to stopping the use of uh, quote unquote detainers, which pressure law enforcement to do um, federal immigration work? I, I, think the fed, you're, I think you're correct. The federal uh, immigration officials should handle it. I think our local police are already overburdened. I know the heroin epidemic here uh, in, in Manchester and in New Hampshire, we have the same issue in Ohio. The police forces in Ohio are understaffed. They don't need to be doing uh, in executing the federal role. Uh, but I do think it's important that we have those agencies in place to get those heroin dealers or whoever they are potentially uh, out of the country. Mm -hmm. But we have to not overburden the local police and local law enforcement. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you, Stephen. And a quick follow-up question to that, Congressman. <coughs> What's your perspective on building a wall on the southern border? Because I know Congress has approved funds for this in the mm -hmm. past, and there are structures there. But what do you think about the whole thing? Yeah, well, the idea of having a wall from, from sea to shining sea is ridiculous. We're not going to put a wall in the middle of the Rio Grande River. We're not going to... Uh, eminent domain property from farmers and ranchers in the southern parts of the southern states. And I think what the president has done by declaring a national emergency is taking money from essential military construction projects like at the Portsmouth Navy Yard, uh, like at the Youngstown Air Reserve Station. Money is going to go from projects that we authorized in the United States Congress, we appropriated. He signed the bill into law and now he's taken money from there. Now, we have got to be, as Democrats, strong on the border. We just got to be smart about it. There are technologies today that we can use. Again, you can't, you know, 90% of the drugs are coming in through the ports of entry. They're also coming in through the water. 
And so we've got to make sure that we're, we have enough dogs, enough personnel. That's where really the problem is. Fentanyl is coming in through the United States Postal Service. We've got to crack that nut. That's going to be very difficult. And to blow billions of dollars on a wall that he told people in Ohio and I'm sure in New Hampshire that Mexico was going to pay for it, I think is completely irresponsible. The national emergency in America today is that the middle class is on life support. That's the national emergency, not the wall. Following up on this, uh, family separation policy. Mm -hmm. If you're the president, what do you do uh, with Immigration and Customs Enforcement, with the management level folks who may not be led there at the, as the President Trump appointees, but who have executed this policy? Do they stay in a role where they could still do something like that? Well, I don't think so. I think you have got to remove people. I mean, you know, part of it is it's coming down the chain of command. Part of it is that President Trump has set this agenda. He has made this a toxic issue politically and to where the United States is literally separating children. I actually went up to Grand Rapids, Michigan and visited children who are our son Brady's age, four and a half years old, where five or six of them are sitting in a classroom uh, by themselves with a teacher and their parents are back in Texas. That is, that is an abhorrent act on behalf of the most powerful country in the world. Those practices need to end immediately. We need to be the country that's looked upon for our values and that we actually care for children and we're not gonna separate them from their parents and understand that the president actually has failed to address the issue in Central America. Why is, if he, need, he needs to pick up his presidential daily briefing every day, actually read it and recognize that gangs are running these countries in Central America. His proposal is to cut the State Department budget for the Central American uh, countries. That's ridiculous. We need to go in there. I'm not saying we need to completely support these com uh, countries, but we need to stabilize them so that their people are safe because the gangs come to the homes, point a gun at the parents and say, we want your daughter to go into the sex trade and we want your son to go into a gang. And if they don't, they get shot. So of course, any parent, I would, you would, or grandparent would say, here's some money, we gotta get you out of here. And that may mean going to the United States. The United States should be strong enough as a country to take those families in and care for them and get them stabilized. But it's the president's issue for not addressing it in the first place. We have a social media question now coming from a Mark Boyd. <clears throat> he asks, uh, Americans continue to pay the highest prescription drug prices in the world. What can be done about this? Well, cu a couple things. Uh, you know, the, the pharmaceutical company has a lock, so I think we've, we've got to figure out how to, in my estimation, publicly finance campaigns. There's just too much money in politics today. It is ridiculous, and the pharmaceutical companies donate a lot of money. We need to negotiate through the Medicare program, the cost down for prescription drugs uh, through the Medicare Part D program. That's essential. They do it in the VA. We should be able to do it. That would help um, bring costs down. A lot of the money that the uh, pharmaceutical companies uh, make is based on the research that the public collectively invests in through the National Institutes of Health. So we have mechanisms within the government to say, hey, you're using our research. How do we can control costs? I think it's really important to, to make sure we put that hammer down on the pharmaceutical industry. Okay, next question comes from Leonard Morrow. Thank Leonard. you for joining us in this conversation. More and more people think that the electoral college should be eliminated. What is your position and why? Well, I, I'm willing to have this conversation uh, about the electoral college. I just, to be quite honest, you need two-thirds of the votes in the House, two-thirds of the votes in the Senate, two-thirds of the states, when right now two-thirds of the states are controlled by uh, Republicans. This is a conversation we can have, but we've got to focus on the economy. We've got to focus on health care. We've got to focus on retirement security for people. I mean, I understand. I'm frustrated, too, that we're, we're winning the popular vote, uh, but not winning the Electoral College. But we've got to go out and learn how to win elections. And we've got to learn how to win races in the Midwest. And that's got to be our focus. I just don't want us getting distracted about a conversation that is a theoretical discussion that we should maybe have our students debating in, in college. The real life people are suffering. And, and they're not going to vote for us if we're talking about the electoral college. We've got to be talking about jobs and wages and pensions and the new economy and getting this, getting this country back on track, unifying the country. I get it. But, and, and I'm happy to have the conversation, but I don't think it's appropriate for us to have right now. Thank you. 
Thank you. Thank you, Leonard. Next question comes from Joan Krimlitz. Welcome. Thank you. Um, what is the federal government's role in making sure that manufacturing <coughs> companies succeed? My first initiative, m my highest priority is for us to establish an industrial policy in the United States. I come from old steel country and we can go back to the late 1970s when we had, had a day called Black Monday in Youngstown when Youngstown sheet and tube closed down, September 19th, 1977. Uh, and because of that, my father-in-law lost his job for 13 months right after buying a house and having a second baby. And you can, I can go back 20 years where my cousin Donnie worked at Delphi, which supplied General Motors. And he had his last act at the manufacturing facility was to unbolt the machine from the factory floor, put it in a box, and send it to China. Or I can go back a couple weeks when my daughter called me crying uh, that her friend has to leave school because her dad lost his job at General Motors. We have got to be a leader in the world. And the, the, the main issue was, in the late 1970s, the technology in the, in the steel mill, in the steel mills in Youngstown, was pre-World War I. The steel industry buried their head in the sand and hoped that the competition and the technology wouldn't destroy them. And my community in this country has been reeling for 30 or 40 years because we failed to do that. So I believe an industrial policy in the United States means this. Artificial intelligence, additive manufacturing, these new technologies, we have no choice. We've got to embrace them. We've got to embrace them and we've got to dominate them. We've got to get them into our older industries. We've got to ramp up productivity and then we've got to cut the worker in on the deal. And there are opportunities to do this and then direct those investments into the distressed communities that have been left behind by the old economy. That to me is an industrial policy. And if I could just say, as Democrats, we cannot be hostile to the free enterprise system. We can be hostile to greed, we can be hostile to income inequality, we can be hostile to concentration of wealth. I am, you are, we all should be. But if we're gonna get out of this mess, it's gonna be by coming together, and that includes working with the private sector to get the job done and out-compete China, out-beat China economically. That's gonna be the key, and it starts with an industrial policy, and that's gonna be a signature issue for us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Joan. Next question comes from George Matthews. Hi, George. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Uh, what specific plan do you have to beat the president? <laughs> uh, highlight the fact that he has not delivered on his promises. Period. End of story. He, had made, he has made so many promises to people in the industrial Midwest and around the country uh, that he has not, he, he, told, he said he was going to raise taxes on the wealthy, he was going to expand Medicare, uh, he was going to do a one and a half trillion dollar infrastructure bill. I'm going to pin that to his backside. And he's, he's not going to be able to get away from it. Because we went in the opposite direction on everything. And in fact, he's made matters worse. Because with the tax cut, we have projected deficits of almost a trillion dollars a year. Which means it's going to be even harder to do an infrastructure bill. It's even going to be harder to do the health care piece. It's going to be harder to invest in the education. He has made commitments. Uh, and, and again, all of the problems weren't created by Donald Trump. I don't blame him for all the problems. I blame Donald Trump for not caring enough to try to fix them. He's too distracted. He wants to beat up former first ladies on Twitter. He wants a race bait. He wants to start fights. He wants to throw gasoline on every cultural rift we have in the United States. And we need to come together. I'm going to bring this country together. We're going to have some bold initiatives. We're going to have new strategies to fix old problems. But in essence, when I talk to voters, I say, hey, you gave him a chance. He didn't deliver. Thanks, George. Next question comes from Mary Kirstein. Good evening. According to several sources, the U.S. is responsible for 33% of worldwide armaments exports. If elected, would you take action to decrease the U.S. role in international arms sales? Well, I think it's important that we don't pepper the world with, with weapons. Uh, most of this, and I, I don't know that uh, stat intimately, but I would say most of this has come from what happened uh, during the war in Iraq and Afghanistan. And the war in Iraq was an absolute disaster. And he, once again, we have not learned from history where we actually arm people with lots of weapons that we think are our friends in the short term. 
And it turns out that in the mid to long term, they're not our friends and they use those very armaments against us. We've got to go out in the world and we've got to be a peacemaker. I, I think we have to have a strong military. I think it's critically important with the advance of China, with the advance of Russia. We can't cede that territory. We have to have a strong military. But we've got to make peace in the world. And that means being an example in the world economically and culturally and politically. The United States needs to be looked upon as that. So peppering the world with these kind of armaments, I would be, I would be committed to end that, at least significantly reduce it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Next question comes from Benjamin Pillis here. Hi, Benjamin. Hi. Would you be willing to work with North Korea if you were president to stop the creation of nuclear weapons? Sure. We, we have got to be engaged with North Korea. Um, at the same time, we also have to make sure we have them checked and we have them in a box. It's a very dangerous r regime. They could wreak a lot of havoc. Uh, and we have to be consistently engaged, and I, I have no problem trying to do that. Uh, look, this, again, this is not easy. There's no magic wand uh, for any of these issues, but we, we have to be engaged. Okay. Thank you, Benjamin. Next question comes from Facebook, and the questioner is Joseph Hazelwood. He asks, will you commit to requiring women to register for the draft in the interest of equality? <laughs> Well, we don't have a draft right now, so that, to me... Uh, but you do have to sign up for selective service. I mean, yeah. at least I remember having to sure, do that a number I, of years yeah, ago. Yeah, every citizen should have to sign up, for sure. Okay. Yeah. And in terms of um, the draft itself, is that something you would repeal someday? I mean, it, it, it still exists in statute. Yeah, uh, I would have to look at that. I, you know, uh, hopefully it never, never comes to that. Um, yeah, so I'll okay. have to look at that. <laughs> Next question comes from Rachel Spira. Welcome, Congressman uh, Ryan. Thank, Thank you, you for coming to speak with us. Thanks for having me. As president, would you be working with members of both parties to promote true bipartisanship, and how would you do that? Yes, I, I, will, uh, I will be reaching across the aisle. Uh, we, ha we have got to heal these wounds. I work very closely with Republicans all the time, whether it's on the Great Lakes, whether it's on energy issues, whether it's on social and emotional learning in our schools. We, we have got to find the issues that we agree upon together and, and move on those issues. That's, that's really going to be critical for us. And I heard, had a great story the other day. There's this little room off of the old chamber uh, right in the Capitol, which is now Statuary Hall, but it used to be the old House chamber. And someone was telling me the story how Lincoln used to come up to the Capitol building. And he sat in this room, and there was a little fireplace there. You could just picture it happening. And he would sit there in front of that fireplace and he was talking to members of the House of Representatives and working them on, on equal rights and on all the big issues of the day. I pledge to do that. I'm in the House. I've been in the House for a long time. This is my 17th year. I will go up to the Capitol. I will sit with members of Congress. We have got to get this done. Again, it's not about dividing. It's about coming together. It's about America. We are at an inflection point in our country's history right now. Okay, thank you, Congressman Ryan, and thank you, Rachel. We'll be able to continue this conversation online and on our mobile app, but that's all the time we have for right now on TV. Coming up, our next conversation with the candidate series, Representative Eric Swalwell will be on the program. And while we're signing off on TV again tonight with Congressman Ryan, we'll be online and on our mobile app, where we're going to continue for another 30 minutes of questions from our studio audience. Thanks for watching, and have a good night.